Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Deepesh Mandalia, and this is this week's episode of the Facebook Ads Power Hour, where I speak to someone that has knowledge of generating sales through Facebook. And I don't know if there are many bigger names out there than today's guest, uh, Mr. Tim Bird. Hey, Tim, how are you doing? Good. How are you guys doing? Awesome. Awesome. Um, so we're going to go through, uh, find out a bit more about Tim. Um, I'm guessing the majority of you know who Tim is. If you are following me, I guarantee you, you'll know who Tim is. If you don't know Tim, um, I'll let him introduce himself as well. And I'm, I'm actually keen to find out a bit more about kind of what motivates Tim and kind of what his plans are. So one of the cool things about these interviews is that I interview people I actually want to learn from and hear from as well. And that means that you guys get the kind of cream of the cream as well. So uh, I'm really looking forward to the next hour. Um, if you guys are on the live, I can see um, lots of people uh, joining. Hit the um, hashtag live uh, or write hashtag live if you are writing a comment or question live. Hashtag replay if you're on the replay so that I or maybe Tim later on can come back and answer some questions as well. Um, and, and throughout, if there's anything that you guys appreciate, hit the like or love button. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a ton of value that we're going to be or Tim's definitely going to be sharing uh, for the next hour or so. So um, we're going to roll straight in. So, you know, Tim Bird, I actually just before we came on this call, just out of curiosity, I went into the ad buyers group and I was like, when did I actually join? So for me, it feels fairly recent. So I'm thinking sometime in 2017. It was actually May 2016. Um, so I don't remember how I actually come across Tim Bird. I'm guessing it was just looking for Facebook groups and seeing Tim through there. Um, and actually, honestly, and I haven't actually told Tim this, Tim's been a massive inspiration for me uh, personally as well. So I looked at kind of what's, what Tim's been doing, the agency, the masterminds, the groups. And I, and I, that, you know, I aspire to do something like that as well. And I actually started that journey myself um, last year to share a lot more of my knowledge. And, and you know, from nothing, things have developed. So it's, it's been a, a great kind of learning curve for me. Tim's actually been doing um, just the Facebook group alone for six years, which like I was... I, I couldn't believe he's been going for six years. Um, and then that just shows you a, a tiny bit of the depth that Tim actually brings. So, um, Tim, I'm going to let you introduce yourself um, before we get going with questions. So over to you. Cool. Well, hey, guys. Uh, my name's Tim Bird. Uh, uh, should I go through a little bit of background, uh, or is that one of the questions? Yeah, absolutely. Go? I mean, just talk about kind of, I guess, who you are, what you do, and uh, some of cool. the background as well. Uh, so I've been doing uh, internet marketing since I was 19. Uh, when I was 18, I was a mortgage broker, and uh, I knew that things were going to collapse. This was like right before the collapse, in like 2006 or whatever. Uh, and uh, I knew stuff was going to collapse. So uh, I got out of that, uh, started an affiliate program. Uh, and uh, I did that for a number of years. Uh, then I started an affiliate network uh, and uh, did that for a few years, did a few of them. Uh, and then I decided that uh, there was a lot more money in being an advertiser. Uh, so I started my own offer. Uh, and this is for, uh, for lead gen at the time uh, for social security disability. We were uh, selling the leads right to the attorneys. Driving, I was driving the traffic in-house. Uh, I, I was running the campaigns. Uh, and uh, you know we did our own landing pages, the whole thing. We didn't have any affiliates or anything. Uh, and, uh, but I was running Facebook ads, right? It was my, kind of my first time, uh, well, my second time running Facebook ads, but the first time, um, was years prior and very little volume. Um, so anyway, social security though, I clicks. There was no bidding on conversions. Uh, there was no ad sets. Uh, you know, but but it was still, um, still. I'm not sure. I think we've actually lost Tim there. Let me see. I'm still here. He's... I'm still here. Tim, are you there? Guys, um, I don't know if you I'm can here, hear I'm me, here. if it's my connection or Tim's that's gone, but if you it's can you. just comment below um, <laughs> if you can actually still hear um, myself, that would be awesome. I'm still here. I don't know if you guys can hear Cheers, me. Cheers, Gil. Right. Um, so I can't <laughs> actually see Tim's screen. Okay, let me stop my camera and start, start it again. Let's... Maybe so. We back? 
Hello. That was yeah. weird. Um, I'm not sure if you lost me or I lost you there. I, I had you the whole time. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. I, I'm going to blame Canada. Like, this keeps on happening. I'm in Canada <laughs> at the moment. Um, Canada is an amazing place, but guys, your internet, you need to sort it out. This is really frustrating. So sorry for uh, cutting you off, Tim. I'll let you carry on. Oh, no worries. So yeah, I have, I have, uh, I have good internet here, so we should be okay. Uh, cool. Uh, so, uh, uh, where was I? So, okay. So I was starting to run Facebook ads, you know, and it was, it was really complicated, like, uh, typical to Facebook fashion. There was tons of glitches and things were changing all the time. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to like talk to other people about it, you know, cause I was still new to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I went on Facebook and typed in like Facebook ads and stuff like that. And I didn't see any, like any groups that really had any engagement going. Um, so I just decided to start one and then invite some of my buddies uh, that were kind of in the affiliate industry um, to also talk about it. Uh, and it took maybe a year to get to a thousand people, something like that, because I didn't like add anyone to the group. Um, I just like posted a couple times on my my personal profile. And then if people wanted to join, then they joined. Um, I didn't like add like all my friends, uh, you know, to the group and hope that they kind of saw it. Um, and then it took like another year to get to like 5,000 people. Uh, and then here I'm like building up my Legion companies and people are uh, uh, kind of asking like, hey, uh, you know, can you run my campaigns for me? And I was like, nah, that's not my business model. You know, like I have my own company, like I can help you. If you ask a question, I'm happy to help you. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's the extent of it. Um, and then people wanted me to do consulting. So I do an hour here, hour there. But I noticed that people kept, uh, they kept asking the same questions over and over and over again. It was, how do I optimize my landing page? Uh, how do I scale my campaigns? Um, so I basically just kind of took all those frequently asked questions uh, and then uh, then some more uh, and uh, and made it into a mastermind. So that's why I kind of started doing that. Uh, and uh, the agency was so I could not have to tell people no that we could run their campaigns. You know, I've been telling people no for years. So that's kind of how that started. That's yeah, I've been, doing this, I've been doing this a long time and, uh, you know, I'm going to keep doing it for quite a while. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think what's interesting is um, I'm guessing a lot of the questions you had six years, five years, four years ago, it's still the questions you're having now. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is, yeah. um, I guess, cohorts refresh. So there's always new people that are coming into Facebook ads, new people have just managed to scale up to, let's say, 1K a day, new people are doing five and six figures a day. And it just keeps on going round like a circle. Um, and, and an interesting thing about the groups is, a similar thing led me to start a group as well. So um, you just talked about the screenshot I shared in AdBuyers end of last year, shared it in a few different places. And then all of a sudden people are asking you, how do you do this? How do you do that? And I, I was just getting a flood of inbox messages mm -hmm. on Messenger. I just couldn't cope. And, you know, I felt bad. I, I don't have the time to answer you guys. And someone said, why don't you just start a group, um, which seemed like a good idea at the time, which has now grown to 4,000. Um, and, and I think that's a really cool way of um, sharing your knowledge with a lot more people. Like one of my big things, and, and certainly for you, is being able to impact as many people as you can. And with ad buyers now, what is it, 70,000 people? At 71,000 we hit now. I mean, like, th that's just a number, it's five digits, but if you think about it, you could fill a huge stadium full of people in ad buyers group. Like, that's, a, that's an insane number of people um, that you're able to support, influence, and lead, et cetera, and it, it must be, like, massively humbling for you as well. It is, it, I never thought, I, I, I started it with the, just the intention to, like, talk about Facebook ads with people, and then for, you know, for years, I was just helping people, like, I would answer every single question, you know, day in, day out for years, just helping people, not charging or anything, you know. Um, but it's funny, that's kind of the same thing. Uh, whenever people message me now asking for, uh, you know, a specific question, uh, you know, I'm like, hey, just, just ask in the group and tag Absolutely. me. And then when I answer, everybody can get the value. Uh, so I don't have to answer the same questions over and over and over, like, one-on-one, -on -one, you know. Um, that's so that's right. kind of the same. It's, it's great, though. It's way better that way. And then you know, a lot of people, you can help a lot of people at one time. Absolutely. So one of the questions I like to um, ask of those that I am speaking to is if you had an opportunity in front of you right now to do anything you absolutely wanted. So like money's not an issue. Um, let's say, you know, you, you're able to do absolutely anything, whatever it is. What would be the one thing that you'd love to be doing right now? Cool. So that's a good question. Uh, so it basically uh, and my goal is that in, you know, five, seven years, uh, uh, I want to build up a couple of companies that I'm working on now and then, uh, you know, eventually uh, uh, kind of funnel that money into what I really want to do, uh, which is uh, venture capital. Um, I really want to just uh, uh, invest in, uh, you know, smart startup companies um, and, uh, you know, ba based on my criteria, you know, whatever I think is trending or whatever at the time. Um, so I, I, you know, I've been following tech and whatnot for a very long time now. 
Uh, and uh, I think there's just a lot of opportunities there. And I think there still will be a lot of opportunities in five to seven years. So, you know, I can just see like flying around the world, meeting cool people, like seeing what their business is all about and, you know, and then helping them, right? Because then you invest in the, there and, you know, then they might, you know, want, uh, you know, help getting their marketing going or, you know, uh, you know, when you can directly impact, uh, you know, with advertising, you can directly impact the value of that company. Um, so if you can invest in it, then help grow it. Uh, you, you're just helping grow your own money at the same time. So it's a win-win. So that's, that's, what, that's my ultimate goal, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting play. So I've been on the other side of VC world where I've worked with startups and kind of um, scale-ups that have taken VC money on board. And you get a whole range of investors, some that like to be completely hands-on and actually start to take control of things, and others that just want to build confidence in the team, give the team the ability to actually step up, bring more resources in, et cetera. Where do you see yourself standing in that? Uh, somewhere in the middle, you know, there'd be some, I, you know, I assume, uh, like if I was investing right now, I'd probably be going pretty hard on, uh, VR and AR. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and since I don't know that much about it, I wouldn't be able to get like super hands-on. Um, I could get a little hands-on with the advertising, um, you know, landing pages and their website and the user experience and stuff like that. But, uh, but of course the actual programming behind it or something like that, you know, I'm not, I'm not that good at it, but, uh. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I sat on the, uh, the, uh, a couple of panels uh, in San Francisco, the, you know, the board of, at a couple of VCs and incubators where people would be pit, you know, asking for money from the investors. And I just kind of you know, recommended yes or no. I was one of many people doing this. But, uh, so I got like a taste for it in San Francisco. And uh, ever since then, I've been kind of like hungry for it. <laughs> it is pretty awesome. So I've done some um, startup advising for different accelerators. And it's actually really cool to see um, the same problems come up again and knowing that you've been through it. So, you know, you've run your own businesses, you've, you've sold, you've scaled, et cetera. And being able to just fast track these guys is truly amazing. And I think, you know, where we are right now, where things were 10, 20, 30 years ago, the access to people like yourselves is so much more open now. And I think that's such a cool thing as well. Um, so I want to ask you about, like, you've got some of these kind of killer strategies and tactics and stuff like that. How do you keep yourself kind of um, coming up with these innovations um, and kind of keep yourself motivated to keep pushing the boundaries of what you're doing with Facebook ads. Uh, it's 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 that's interesting. Well, it, to me, it's a challenge, right? Um, when I was doing mortgages, uh, I felt like after six months that um, you know I was very good at it, and and it wasn't really changing. The industry wasn't really changing, um, so it wasn't really a challenge anymore. Um, and uh, uh, you know, so I, I've done a number of things. Same thing. I was you know was a headhunter for a law firm for a while uh, before I started the internet stuff. Uh, and, uh, uh, but with the internet, right, it like changes, especially Facebook ads, right? Compared to any other platform, it changes so fast. Uh, and there's so much traffic on it, uh, so much volume. Uh, and then there's literally stuff changing like every single day, uh, that, uh, you know, it's just very challenging. So, and, and it's a 24 seven game. It's not like the stock market. Even I did day trading for a bit, but then it, it's only open like eight or nine hours a day and then it's closed, right? You can't like do it all the time. So I'm kind of a workaholic a little bit. So. I like to like work a lot and 24 seven stuff changing. That's like perfect for me, you know? Absolutely. So uh, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, day trading because um, I did six months of day trading. I never got nice. out of a test account. It was all just trying to make sense of it. And I, I do relate it to Facebook ads so much. Like there's so much you can learn from day trading, you know, like you do stop loss rules and uh, mm -hmm. looking at trends and analysis. It's all born out of that kind of world of looking for, like, for example, I did currency pairs. And in currency pairs, all you're looking at is profiting one or two percentage, pay, uh, percentage uh, point differences on, on your trades. And it's a tiny amount. And you might make $50 or $20, but you have to exit and you have to get out because it changes so quickly. Um, and I'm starting to, especially over the last year, use kind of automation to start building that kind of logic into Facebook ads because I think it's becoming so much similar. So you've probably seen it yourself where people say, you know, I'm getting really good ROAS up until like six, seven o'clock in the evening and then it starts to die down. Most advertisers just let their spend continue and then they go from like a four or five ROAS and it'll drop down to three or two. But you mm -hmm. have to react to the auction. And I think certainly since February and March, things have gone a lot more haywire than they've ever been. Um, I mean, what's your thoughts on that kind of stuff? Uh, well, as far as day parting, uh, I totally agree. And it kind of depends what you're promoting. Um, when I was doing all the, uh, the stuff for lawyers uh, a few years ago now, uh, it was funny, like Monday through Thursday, uh, I would stop my campaigns at exactly 4 p.m. Uh, because then after that, my ROI would take a big hit. But on Friday, some people leave work early, 
I had to stop it at 3.30. Otherwise, I took a big hit. Um, and then, uh, you know, and started to back up. I, I just had it down to a science. And we have one client at the agency where we run it from uh, midnight to 4 a.m. Then from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. it's off because for some reason it does crappy. Then from 8 a.m. to like noon it's on. And then it's off for a couple hours, then back on for three hours, then off for the day. Um, because those other hours were just crap. So when we did it that way, though, the ROI massively went up. Um, but it is just like day trading. That's why I have the, the stop loss rule. And, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot from doing that, you know, like following the trends uh, and just, uh, you know, just watch. It's just data, right? At the end of the day, it's just data. And I, I love data. So, <laughs> and, and maybe Facebook need to add that to Blueprint, like literally just go and start day trading for a couple of months, learn how the auction system kind of works and implement that back. Don't um, give away our secrets. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Sorry, <laughs> um, if everyone's listening, don't share that with anyone else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you are on the live call, um, do post up your questions. We're going to come over, come through um, the question part probably in the next five, 10 minutes. Um, put a hashtag live if it is live. If, it's, if you're looking at replay, hit ha hashtag replay, and then we'll come back um, when we can to answer those as well. Um, so the other question I've got is, like the next six months, you know, even like month by month, Facebook's changing fast. Now, in the next few months, we're going to head into holiday season and it's going to get crazy at the end of the year. What do you see coming up in the next six months and kind of what are you focusing on? Uh, well, my main focus right now is ad leaks, which I guess we can kind of touch on later. Yeah. But uh, uh, but uh, uh, traffic wise, um, uh, bids start getting really crazy uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, and uh, And if you just I found that's actually how I came up with the bully method. I uh, was that uh, I was doing a uh, uh, cl class action lawsuit leads, um, and it usually was costing me like one to three hundred dollars for a form fill. Um, so it was very expensive, and I find that the algorithm doesn't really work that well at higher CPAs. It works pretty decent at like you know under ten C under ten dollar CPAs or even under twenty. Um, but once you start kind of getting over twenty dollars, is when you start getting into like the you kind of need to to manual bid range at higher budget. Um, you can kind of get away with it at a lower budget uh, uh, without it, but but because Facebook has to like guess the amount of conversions you're going to get based on the number of clicks, it has to like keep estimating all this. Uh, it gets more difficult when there's like a larger spread there. Um, so uh, uh, so that's when I figured out. Uh, you know, I was getting like no traffic in December uh, when all these big retailers, um, you know, that are mostly e-com, you know, uh, were outbidding me for her for Q4 traffic. Uh, and uh, and I was like, well, if I just keep upping the bid, I'll get traffic eventually, right? That's how the auction works. So then I keep upping it up and upping it. And then finally, it just was so high. It was like four times higher than I actually was like, it was like $900 a, I was bidding or something. Uh, and uh, But then I started getting traffic uh, and my conversions cheaper than I was any other time of the year. And I was like, whoa, 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 this is fucking weird. Like, that doesn't make sense, you know? Uh, and then I just started like thinking about it. And then it like, and then I backed it out into my theory and I tested the theory a bunch, like on different stuff, and it just kept working. So, um, so yeah, it, my, it, is, it, is, it is crazy. Like when I when I first came across this same thing, so it was Q4, I think it was 2015, and actually someone in my team did this, and they were manual bidding. Our cost per uh, acquisition was like ten dollars, and he he started bidding thirty, forty dollars on this kind of prime US. Like, what are you doing? I said, what, like, I, I can't pay that much. You know, I don't have the margin and stuff. He goes. Yeah, but I've just done some testing. And what's really interesting is our CPA is actually going down the more we're bidding. And I couldn't get my head around, like, <laughs> how, how can that happen? That was before I properly understood manual bid. Um, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, I don't think people properly appreciate the whole concept behind bullying, um, which is to actually make it so expensive for other people. But you need to be prepared to pay a little bit more initially. And I think that's something which I see you talk about so much. I don't think people quite understand that, that the bully method isn't you scale up and you instantly profit. You have to take a slight hit and then come back. Is that something you just you can just expand on? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you got to think like like a bully, right? A bully is going to bully like in school. A bully is going to like bully people, but he might get hit a few times, you know, um, like it's not just like pure profit. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the way the bully method works is a, a couple of ways. One, uh, you know, people are literally you're bullying people out of the auction. So. Most people have like a two or three day rule, right? Like if they're unprofitable, they'll pause, but they'll try again tomorrow. If they're unprofitable again, they'll pause, but they might try again another day. Some people will pause early if they're not profitable, um, but you got to wait for those people to pause uh, and you're like bullying these people out of your niche or your audience. Um, and, uh, and then your cost goes down just because you're, you're kicking these people out. But that can take a few days, you know? So you do sometimes pay more and you might be unprofitable for a few days, 
Uh, but uh, but then your costs come down um, as long as you're not bidding against like Apple or something like that. But but even then, generally, if they're like going off any sort of you know in, like even cost per view metrics or anything, then they're typically just going to go to a different audience where they're getting cheaper cheaper views. Uh, but what's interesting actually is that it doesn't only work because you're bullying people. It works uh, because you're bidding so high that you get better placement in the news feed and you get better quality users. Uh, I mean, that higher placement in the news feed gives you a higher CTR, essentially like an artificially higher CTR, uh, which then gives you a lower cost per click, which then gives you a lower cost per conversion uh, with a higher quality user. Um, so you, that combined with the bullying aspect of like, you know, kicking your competition out um, can make for like really, really awesome uh, you know, ROI. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things that people um, need to understand is when Q4 kicks in and CPMs do grow up, you can counter that with really strong CTR and bidding for mm -hmm. audiences that have a higher conversion rate. And actually you'll end up with, in some cases, your CPA being better through that period than it is the rest of the year. And I think that's such an important thing as well. Yeah, you can, uh, people, you know, CPMs definitely go up, but intent goes up as well. Absolutely. Um, so as long as you can optimize and stuff, you can actually come out even cheaper than you were the rest of the year and do much more volume. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Tim, do you do any um, affiliate marketing still, or do you do, do any drop shipping, anything like that? Uh, I, I don't anymore. Um, I haven't run an affiliate offer now in maybe like a couple of years, something like that. Uh, and uh, I, I try to only run my own offers, um, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, uh, so now I get to set up campaigns uh, uh, the next day or two for ad leaks as soon as the uh, uh, the the trial the 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 good the deal I have going on right now basically ends Friday. So. Um, after that, I'm going to set up campaigns at the higher price. Um, uh, so I'm really excited for that because I haven't run campaigns personally in like, I don't know, six months now or something. Uh, besides like the retargeting and like light stuff that I run for myself, you know, my own brand. Um, but, uh, but I'm really excited for that. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, what did I run? What was the last stuff I ran? Oh, the last stuff I ran affiliate offer wise was uh, about a year, a year and change. It was like early last year, actually. Uh, and it was a uh, giddy uh, a few of the offers that giddy up has they have like really cool like white hat unique offers uh so i was running like uh, uh i memories was one of them uh it's like this uh, thing where it translates like old pictures to like you know digital uh for for older folks uh and uh and i think fixed also like the odd uh, the uh, the auto thing uh and then tracker so I, I was running like a few of those uh you know uh, early last year um uh when we had time cuz uh, uh that was right when i started the agency um, so I had like a, you know, a couple X, like my, my media buyers had extra time. Uh, so I kind of used uh, those affiliate offers to help train them uh, before they were fully loaded with clients. Um, uh, but then once we f were fully loaded with clients, I just, you know, I'd rather run, I'd rather run stuff that's guaranteed profit rather than like, you know, having to, you know, you know, basically like what, I'd rather run stuff that is guaranteed profit rather than stuff that's not guaranteed profit. So, uh, so then we just, I, since, since then I haven't run anything, but. Uh, cool. Um, so one of the things I'm interesting more around is kind of masterminds and, um, you know, I, I think that your format, your following for masterminds and retreats and stuff is absolutely awesome. Um, how do you kind of ensure that every single person leaves with value and um, like what kind of people do attend these kind of masterminds from your perspective and has that changed over the years? That's a good question. So yeah, actually, uh, you know what, that's interesting. It actually has changed over the years. Um, I've been doing it for like little over just over two years now so it's been two years um, and uh, in the beginning it was it was mostly affiliates uh, and uh, uh, and then in America and then it was well and in Europe and Asia uh, but it's funny in Europe and Asia it was a, a heavy amount of like black hat affiliates but that wanted to go white hat but they just didn't really know like all the white hat tricks right they're like pro at black hat um, but white hats like kind of a different beast um, so that, that's what a lot of it was for the first like maybe year um, but then for the last year, um, it's been uh, like now, usually when at the mastermind, there's usually only like, you know, if there's like 25 people there, maybe like two or three people will be affiliates. Uh, and then there'll be like a handful of like a few lead gen guys, uh, a few info products, a few media buyers from agencies, uh, and then a bunch of basically uh, advertisers that just own their own. It could be e com or whatever. Um, some drop shipping, some where they do the manufacturing and everything. So it's kind of like a really good mix of everybody. Uh, and most people that come uh, are spending somewhere between a thousand dollars a day currently uh, up to uh, the most I had so far was one guy that was spending uh, 50k a day nice. um, and, it, and it's probably more around the 5k a day range on average um, is what I'd say the average person there 
Um, so it's a very good crowd, though. It's like intermediate to advanced. Uh, it's not like uh, you know a bunch of noobs or something. Uh, so people that uh, do want to meet you know like-minded people like that, then the masterminds are great. Um, but I've had a lot. You know, the the uh, the beginner audience is something that I haven't focused on at all. Um, you know, I've been just focusing on the advanced stuff, but that's such a small percentage of the market. Uh, so, uh, so this year I am doing one for beginners actually in LA um, in a, in a few months. So I'm kind of excited to to try that because it's the first one I'm doing. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's definitely changed, uh, and it's it's so the most of them though they're for, they're for advanced guys. Like if you you know uh, if you don't if you're not already spending money on Facebook or you're brand new to it, then like I wouldn't recommend that you come to the the intermediate or advanced masterminds. It'll just be a waste of money, honestly. Like you need to like get some more experience first. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, we're going to go through into questions shortly, so um, do be hitting the questions below, and I'll, I'll pull those out for Tim. Um, my final question is like, why did you actually start the masterminds, and and kind of um, what's coming up for the next three six months for you in terms of masterminds and retreats? Cool. So uh, yeah, if I started the masterminds, uh, I kind of touched on this earlier, but uh, I started them because I kept getting the same questions from consulting uh, and. Uh, uh, and I wanted to, I don't like usually trading time for money. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so then I was like, hey, how can I make more per hour? Uh, and, and I charge a lot per hour. For one-on-one -on -one consulting, I charge between like two and $3,000 an hour. Um, because generally people, only, people need one or two hours. They don't need like a whole lot of time. Uh, and I go through stuff real quick and, you know, just a few good tips and they make it back in a few hours usually, right? So depending on the volume. But, uh, but I was like, hey, how can I make more per hour? And how can people spend less per hour to get more information? Like, how is it like a win, 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 win? Uh, and uh, and that was from masterminds, um, where I can just cover everything. Uh, and uh, and you kind of asked a minute ago too, how does every, how do I make sure everyone gets value? Uh, and everything that I teach can be used for anything you're promoting on Facebook. It doesn't have to be e-com or a lead gen. It could be uh, digital info products, uh, uh, you know, anything webinars, uh, mobile app installs. Uh, uh, you know, any honestly, like anything. Uh, so, uh, so everyone, and and then people ask questions throughout, uh, and then uh, you know, if people have a specific question that uh, you know I may not cover, then they'll usually come to me during like one of the breaks and just ask, and then I answer. Uh, so I make sure though that everybody leaves like super happy, uh, and uh, uh, I've never had one complaint, honestly. Um, you know, I'm sure some people liked it more than others, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, but I get like rave reviews. I like hardly advertise them, and they always sell out. Uh, and uh, so I'm excited though. There's uh, three more I'm doing this year. Uh, one in America, uh, one in Europe, and one in Asia. Uh, the one in America is in uh, Los Angeles in November with Maxwell Finn, actually a buddy of mine, a super smart guy. Uh, then a uh, uh, couple all stars here in, uh, in London uh, with uh, Depeche and I don't know how to pronounce it, Gupreet. Is that how you pronounce it? That's uh, right. So I'm really excited for that one. That's going to be the first one that we live stream uh, that I've ever live streamed of any of the events. Uh, and uh, uh, for anyone that's interested in coming, um, it's uh, it's my uh, my usual awesome mastermind content. It doesn't have to be for e-com. It, it does totally work for e-com also. Uh, but then it, for the same price, you also get a Depeche and Gupreet uh, and an extra, a whole extra day uh, and extra networking. Uh, so it's a great, great, great value. Um, and I'm excited to learn some of the stuff that you teach because um, I don't really go to a lot of like uh, masterminds and stuff like that myself, like, uh, besides my own. Um, and, uh, you know, there's very few people in the, the industry that I, uh, you know, I really feel like uh, I can learn a good amount from, uh, you know, whether, you know, like stuff like uh, post-purchase retargeting or just random stuff, you know. Um, so, uh, so I'm excited to learn the stuff that you have to teach too. Uh, That's awesome. I'm humbled. Yeah, and then I have a, I have a, a Bangkok in December. Uh, and then what I'm super stoked for is the retreat, uh, which is like right after the uh, convention. And it's just like uh, 30 people. And like I rented like four sick villas and like a 100-foot yacht. And it's just going to be all of us just like partying. There's no speeches or PowerPoints or anything like that. It's just like networking and fun. Uh, I did it last year and it was just, I mean, people were like waking up on the stairs in the morning and uh, like just, you know, like just had too much to drink. But it was just a, such a great time. I made like all like really, really good friends with people and like lifelong like bonds that you get out of that, you know, that you don't get from just like going to like a convention and talking to somebody for five minutes when you're like drinking with them for like three days straight and going out to restaurants and kind of partying a little bit and uh, you know, and you're in a, like a tropical place, beautiful weather. It's just like a, it's like a magical kind of thing. I, I've seen some of the names on the list. I mean, obviously um, you're there, but some of the other names there are pretty powerful as well. And I, I honestly, if I 
can get the time out um, between family and <laughs> business, I'm there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm likely, I'm 99% going to be at Affiliate World uh, Conference anyway in Bangkok. Um, and, and I like the way that you kind of attach these events to main events like that. I think that's such a smart thing to do as well. Well, yeah, then people, then it's only like a hotel cost basically, right? Like you already are paying the plane ticket and kind of taking the time off from your life. Yeah. Uh, so you just have to take a couple extra days off and extend exactly. the trip a little bit, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, we have uh, me, uh, uh, Maxwell Finn, uh, the Tan Brothers, uh, James Van Ellswick, uh, I think Nick Shackelford, he's trying to see if he can go. Uh, depends on, on work stuff. Uh, and, uh, and a bunch of other VIPs, just awesome people coming, honestly. So I really hope you can make it. That'd be awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, keep your questions coming. Just my final question for you, Tim. What does downtime look like for you? So outside of <laughs> your public life and your A-star kind of... Um, uh, thing that people see online. What do you do? Is this kind of just chill out? I honestly, I work quite a bit. Um, but when I'm not working, uh, I like watching like uh, interesting TV shows and movies. I'll watch like documentaries and stuff. I don't watch like you know Keeping Up with the Kardashians and like kind of like BS like that. I like a lot like you know like girl ex girlfriends would watch basically, right? Uh, but uh, uh, so I, I I do that and then uh, and then I like going out to like bars and stuff with my buddies out here. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, and then I go on like two or three dates a week. Usually like I'm still like I'm single right now. I'm still trying to find like the right well, girl. You need to get on that if you want to hit a comment up about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you are a cute girl and you know anything about Facebook ads, you move to the front of the line. So hit me up. Uh, but uh, the girls in Southern California, man, let me tell you, they are rough. Uh, just they cutthroat, you know. Um, so uh, so it's just tough, you know, but, uh, you know, I'll know if I'll find the right one eventually. And in the meantime, I just focus on. You know, I just work a lot because between the masterminds, the agency, uh, I have 12 Facebook groups. I don't know if you know this. I have like 12 groups, not just that one that. main group. Yeah, I have uh, 150,000 almost people total. Wow. Okay. Um, I have a Google ads group, uh, influencer group, email marketing, native ads, a job board group, uh, but like, like everything, a uh, local business group, and each have like eight or 10,000 people kind of in each one. Um, uh, so between that and then uh, ad leaks, agency Y, the masterminds, retreats, like I'm fucking busy. You know? Yeah, you don't sleep, right? <laughs> um, yeah, well, actually, you know, yeah, I sleep like six, seven hours a night, kind of. But my sleep schedule is so weird because I deal with people over, all over the world just like you do. But uh, my sleep schedule is so bad. I probably am usually awake till like 4 a.m. California time because then I can talk to people in like uh, UK, uh, Europe, uh, and then also hit the Asia people when they're kind of waking up. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and then I would sleep until like 11 AM or something, which is, you know, my, my business partner here on the agency and stuff, he, uh, it's like, he wakes up at like 6 AM, which is like almost when I'm going to bed. Uh, uh so it's, uh, it's tough, you know, to be, uh, international, but you know, it's fun. I like it. And, and you, and you like driving cause I've seen your sweet ride and I've seen that you've, um, been touring a lot and missing it as well. Oh yeah. I love my, I love my, my car. Uh, I don't like bragging much, but I, my Bentley is super sexy. It's got the the beautiful white interior, uh, and so cool. uh, uh, it, it it fits in nice in Southern California. Absolutely, cool. So we're going to go into questions. Um, so I'm going to go through the questions that we've got down here. Um, I don't know if you, you can see them, Tim. If you can't, I'll read them back out. But keep your questions um, below, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can right now. If you're on the replay, just type in hashtag replay so that we know that it's on the replay. And ideally, you hit the uh, type in hashtag live if it's live. So I'm going to go through. Um, there's a question from Adrien. Um, Tim, did you invest in the Friends ICO? Which one? Friends with a Z at the end. Oh, now I can see it. Oh, cool. Uh, I did not, and uh, that's a good. That's a good uh, crypto in general. Um, so it's funny. I actually I invested uh, in Bitcoin like four years ago or something five years ago now, like quite a while ago, it was at like $300 a coin at the time. Uh, and I bought like 10 grand worth, right? Nothing crazy, nothing, nothing crazy. Uh, Cause at the time it was very, very still like, who knows what's gonna happen with it. I mean, it's still like that, but like four years, five years ago, very even worse. Uh, and uh, uh, then I was just gonna hold, I was just, I was just holding on, you know, I was holding it. Uh, then uh, like a year later or something, it was at, I don't know, like a thousand bucks a coin or something. Uh, and, uh, and some fucking hacker, I uh, came in and jacked my entire Coinbase account via the API. It wasn't even like my wow. password and stuff. It was like an API key, something or other that they did, you know? Uh, and uh, so after that, I was like, fuck crypto. Like, I'm so over this, you know? Uh, but then like a year ago, maybe six, eight months, whatever, recently, uh, you know, 
crypto's fucking going through the roof, right? It was like in January, like around there, and when like everybody's fucking making tons of money. So I'm like, ah, okay, I'll like kind of stick my toe in a little bit again, you know? Uh, so I buy just like 10K worth again, right? That's like kind of like my play around with number, like who gives a fuck if it goes away? Uh, and, uh, uh, and then of course I like, I like buy it like the worst time, fucking it tanks like right after. Uh, and, uh, uh, but then I had somebody pay me in Ethereum, like 10 K in Ethereum for like a couple of mastermind seats. Uh, oh, and cool. then I got lucky and it like went up like 50% in like a week or two. I, I held on to it. So I like made a little bit back of my loss, but like I'm still in, then I sold it out and I'm still in for my original 10 K, but now I'm, I think it's like down to like 5 K or something like, so I'm just like, I'm just hodling. I, I do not want to invest a lot in crypto. I don't, I, I use, I had a, uh, for a while, a medical marijuana dispensary actually in Los Angeles. Uh, and, uh, uh, this was when I was 24. So like eight years ago. Uh, and, uh, it was really, really beautiful. I spent like, uh, like all my savings at the time was like half a million bucks, uh, like liquid. Uh, and, uh, I was 24 years old, you know? Uh, and, uh, uh and then it crashed and burned the city changed zoning regulations. Like it was just very un, you know, you didn't know what was going, you know, didn't know what was happening at the time. So it was risky. And I feel like crypto is kind of in that same area now where, you know, you don't really know what's going on. You can make money in the meantime, uh, but you need to kind of like get out quick. Uh, you know, if you do make a big profit, I would just get out. Um, uh, so, you know, I I'm just hodling though at like low volume here and I'm just kind of playing it by ear, but yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, next question is from Alex. In March, one of my clients CPL went from a hundred to $300 mm -hmm. nearly overnight. So can definitely, Confirm. Okay, that's not a question. It sounds like more of a statement. Um, cheers, Alex. That's probably related to something we were saying at the time. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was for the uh, I think the Q4 or something going up. That the bullion right. method. Oh yeah. Cool. So, um, question from Naveen. Um, I brought it up on screen, but that's that's actually taking up the whole. Screen. I can read it. Okay. Cool. So I've noticed that my peak buying time is in the morning. Sometimes feels that ad sets are surfing too late. Wish they had a lot more budget during the peak buying time instead of midway or later in the peak buying window when budgets increase based on a trigger. Um, so I know that Naveen's um, definitely doing the kind of surfing and shotgun strategy um, across his high scaling account. Uh, so the question is, if I wanted to promote this behavior, should I be triggering surfing rules based on an up funnel event like initiate checkout instead of waiting on purchases to occur? Should I be looking at creating surf triggers uh, surf triggering account specific indicators like CPM, number of link clicks, and number of initiate checkouts or other ratios. Uh, that's that, that's a good question. Um, uh, and uh, if you look at your, your your ad sets that are doing really well purchase wise, and you find that like there's a really high correlation to your cost per initiate checkout or something, uh, then I'd say you could try that. Um, but a lot of times I find that there's not a huge correlation. Um, and that, because uh, uh, the algorithm, unless you're optimizing for that, the, al the algorithm is finding people that are most likely to purchase. And that doesn't necessarily mean that your cost per initiate checkout will be lower. It, it might, but um, not, but not always. And in many cases, it's not. Um, so I personally find that I like to just do rules based on, I, I like to do rules based on the actual events that I'm doing. So if you find that like the morning is, is a better time, uh, uh, you know, sales wise, uh, then, uh, then what I would do is I would just crank my budgets up so that it starts off and spends much more, much faster Then you can surf easier and then just pause early for the day. Um, and then restart it again in the morning or at midnight or whatever. Um, uh, you know, you don't have to run your campaigns the whole day. Uh, but yeah, if you just start higher, then it'll spend much faster Then you can surf much faster. Uh, and, uh, and then you, you should be good to go. Uh, one thing you could also do actually, uh, is you could, uh, make an, uh, you could make an ad account in a time zone uh, where it's a little more conducive to uh, the uh, you know the time zone of wherever you're running traffic to. That that might also work. That's that's a really good point. So I've seen a lot of questions about you know my um, account is in Asia, but I'm selling to the U.S. and yeah. uh, does that impact the learning and cycles? It does because your twelve your twenty four hour cycle is mm -hmm. based on where your um, ad account time zone is set up. Obviously, if you're advertising in a different country, that does have a big impact as well. Um, now, one of the things, um, Aaron, just leading on to initiate checkout and different pixel events. So we've got a client now, for example, their ticket value is four to $500, and they make the most of their purchases within three or four days, and then they have a long tail off of um, purchases because it's a high consideration product, it's, it's furniture. And so um, you know, one thing to say about that is, 
we know, for example, that cost per add to cart and cost per initiate checkout is our lead metric. So when we're scaling up, for example, on this account, we know that we need to maintain a cost per add to cart of below $15 because over two weeks, that bottoms out for a really good rise for us. Uh, so wh what I would say is look at your ticket value. Um, Naveen, I know that your kind of ticket value is fairly low, and therefore I would absolutely focus on purchase. But for those that have much higher ticket values and your consideration path is that much higher, and you're not going to be able to step your budget up and immediately see, see sales, then consider events kind of further further up the funnel. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, question from Jerry. So nowadays, all of my products are working for two, three days, then no sales. What's Ooh. the issue? Uh, I see so that all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll kind of let you lead on that. Uh, so, uh, so the, it could be a number of things, but uh, but typically, I find that one, you're getting all the low hanging fruit right away. Uh, so that's why usually you kind of start out really good out of the out of the bat. Uh, but generally, when I see that it's dying after a few days, it's because you're not feeding it enough data. Um, you're probably only getting like a few conversions a day or five even. You really need to get like eight to ten conversions a day minimum, and you really want to try to be more on the twenty mark. Um, otherwise, literally after a few days, it just dies. Um, it usually will just stop spending altogether. But if it's still spending the full budget every day and getting you no know, sales, then it's probably like a different issue. Um, but I, I would, I'm, I'm guessing it's just not spending. So, so around March time, Facebook updated their um, info and said, you know, from 30 conversions a week, we now need 50. Um, and I think honestly, a lot of people, including myself, just took that with a grain of salt and said, you know, yeah, it's Facebook just saying what, whatever Facebook say. But actually, honestly, the more conversions you feed it, it is having a massive positive impact on stability. So uh, don't take that advice um, for less than what it is, which is absolutely make sure you're getting your conversions every day um, per ad set as well. Um, line, uh, next question from Steve. What's the best size for cold testing audiences? Uh, I personally don't like touching any audience less than a million people. Um, and I try to be more in the like two, two plus million and then, like two to seven million, something like that. Um, Cause then it's not too broad, but, but honestly, I find that very broad audiences are working great also. So um, I'd say that any size audience, hold on, someone's fucking here. Um, I'd say that, uh, that uh, any audience size uh, over 2 million is good. Like even if it's, even if it's like 50 million people, that's totally fine. Absolutely. Let's, let's see who's okay. at Tim's door. And I'm on a computer, so shh. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Um, so next question, um, where's it going? Going back to surfing, actually. So what are the cons of shotgun surfing 500 or more $20 per day ad sets? Uh, you can only surf that if your conversion cost is like a dollar because uh, you need to have enough conversions before noon, ideally, like ideally before like 8 a.m. by 8 a.m. Um, so on a $20 day ad set, you're not going to have enough conversions. Uh, so the cons are you can't. I wouldn't recommend you surf that at all. Uh, shotgun, you could do shotgun still and just kind of keep the good ones, kill the bad ones. Um, so that would kind of work, but you're not going to get enough conversions on those ad sets. So you're like gambling and like playing with, you're just like, it's literally just like, you might as well roll a dice because uh, uh, you're, not, you're not letting the Facebook algorithm optimize properly with those small ad sets. Um, so I find that's kind of like a short-lived strategy. So I, I would personally do way, way fewer uh, larger ad sets, like maybe like 20, I didn't do the math on that, but like, you know, 20 ad sets total and then divide your budget by that. And that, that usually will do a lot better in the long term, at least. Absolutely. Um, next question from Imran. So Tim suggests to have three or five X, the CPA goal is the budget for an ad set. So if my target CPA is $10 and I start my ad set at $50 and after $10 spent, I see there's no sales, should I kill it? And he's saying, um, isn't it true that we're aiming for ad sets to start working right out of the bat? As I'm on a shoestring budget, I don't want to lose money, um, is, is just a bit. Can you put the question back up on the screen? Yeah, so it, it's kind of talking about, um, so, so Imran's got a um, goal of hitting $10, creating a $50 ad set. And I guess the question is, when, when well, should he decide to pause it? One, that's, that's the first problem. You're only going to get five conversions a day, so I would never recommend you have a three to five x uh, goal. As uh, you know, three to five x CPA is the goal. I always recommend ten x or higher, ideally twenty x. Um, so that's problem number one. Uh, problem number two is if your goal is ten dollars and you're killing it after ten dollars, what happens if that next click was a sale? Right? 
uh, and then the next click after that could be a sale, and then you would have been at a great ROI. I find that actually one mistake that a lot of people make is that they kill stuff too early, uh, and, uh, and and you know it could be profitable. Um, and many times it will be profitable because the, the algorithm has to like find your converters for the day and then it like lat latches onto them. So if you kill it too early, it like just was about to get there and then you like cut it. Um, uh, so if you're doing, uh, there's actually a cool uh, method for sm slightly smaller budgets because um, my shotgun and my shotgun method is, is more for kind of like high budget, um, but for slightly lower budgets, um, uh, the uh, one of the uh, uh, guys in the group, Alex, uh, in the Ad Leaks group came up with this, it's called this, he called it the, sawed off shotgun method because it's like oh, a cool, shorter cool. shotgun you know <laughs> uh and uh and it's a similar strategy but with fewer ad sets and just kind of like more ads per ad set uh which is kind of a cool way to do it uh so uh so that that's kind of what i would recommend uh for smaller budgets but don't kill it don't kill it uh too early um that's always a big problem if you if you need to kill something early i guess base it on uh kind of like a depeche set and maybe like correlate it to like your add to carts or initiate checkouts or you know, whatever is like a, a highly correlating metric, you know, um, then you can you can kill it early too, like that. So, so maybe a question for you, Tim, also is how do you then structure shotgun and surf with your retargeting? Because often retargeting will capture the sale and then make the cold audience look like it's actually not doing its job of purchase, but actually the purchase is ended in retargeting. How do you handle that? So, yeah, attribution is always like something that I could go like on and on and on about. Um, and, uh, you know, I like to try to pass the UTM codes into Google and then you can change the attribution in there to like be like partial first click, partial last click. And you can kind of attribute to both, um, uh, which is pretty cool. But uh, but honestly, what, what I what I usually do, because it's a lot easier, uh, is uh, I look at the 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 cold uh, the cold uh, traffic campaign uh, completely separate from retargeting. Um, I typically assume that if my cold campaign or cold ad set, let's say, has a, a lower cost per, per purchase, that those users are typically better users or more qualified, my ad copy is better, whatever, that generally those are going to convert better in retargeting also. Um, so as, if I have a high cost re, uh, you know, cold audience, then I'm going to kill that in favor of a, a, a better cold audience because then my retargeting costs should go down. It, maybe not, right? Like if if I had time, I would dig through analytics and that all day. But uh, but generally, I try to just be profitable or as close to it on the, the cold traffic, uh, and then tr I just kind of treat them separate. Absolutely. So an interesting thing, and something I do want to go through the mastermind. It would be good to get your feedback when we do it in a few months' time. Is especially on accounts doing less than fifty dollars AOV, is looking at Facebook analytics and looking at where the majority of people convert. Most people will probably convert within the first day. And what I'm actually doing is not triggering retargeting until day two. So actually giving the cold audience mm. a chance to convert. And I've seen that actually work really well. Uh, and it's a two-sided thing. Like, number one, don't waste your budget or time on retargeting if people are going to buy anyway, but then kick in if they're not. And then secondly, it means that the, the sale gets correctly attributed to that cold ad set. And it's a, I think it's a win-win. Um, that's interesting. That's, so you just you just make like a like a uh, add to car, let's say, or review content one within a one day, and then you exclude that. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that's cool. Which, which is something definitely worth uh, testing because this the, the attribution thing is a complete nightmare. Like Facebook have the data, they're just not surfacing it to say you know this ad set or this ad had the yeah. first impression that this one created the purchase. I mean, once they reveal that and they give you the whole stream, and and I've spoken to Facebook, they are trying to do this, but they, they've been saying this for over a year now, but they've got the data. They know exactly it's which data. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's complicated. That's the thing. Uh, but once they do reveal that, that will give us a whole different level of data as well. Um, cool. So a question from Edmund. So I was watching the Nick Peroni interview, and he said one of the most important metrics he looks at is cost per ad to cart. Do you guys also gauge that? And if so, do you compare it to your profit margin um, or other metric? Now you handle this one, Pesh. Yeah, so for me, I do look at cost prior to cart. So one of the caveats I will say is, and, and this comes down to um, any of the kind of early lead metrics, is when it comes to your e-com store, so I, I know as a follower of Nick Perona, you're, you're most likely doing e-com, is your gauge of success isn't cost per acquisition, it's return on ad spend. And the cost per ad to cart is a strong relation to your cost per acquisition, but not on your ROAS, because I'm happy to pay more for a cost per ad to cart if I'm getting a better uh, ROAS because I'm getting a better audience, et cetera. So I actually did an A-B split test of uh, using the Facebook uh, built-in split test tool to test two different audiences and to test um, optimizations of um, 
different manual bids. And what I found is that when I went on a high manual bid, my cost per ad to cart went up, but I got a much better return on ad spend. So yes, it's an indicator, but I wouldn't just look at that and say, that's my success metric. Um, so I've got multiple accounts where if, if we feel like we need to make decisions, we will make decisions on the cost per ad to cart. But I also know that sometimes I'll get a better ROI. So I think that's the best way of handling it. I don't know if you've got anything else to add to that. I, I totally agree. I find that a lot of times a higher add to cart means a higher uh, uh, a higher quality user uh, that will spend that'll be a higher you know it'll have a higher AOV, um, which will give you a higher ROAS. So yeah, I, I try to only I try to really only base my decisions on the actual metric I want and not on these you know indicators, which are indicators, but not really, you know, kind of. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, a question here on agency acquisition. So, um, so there's two parts of this. Anything for outbound acquisition, and then he said for newbie agency. So the question is, I guess, have you done any? I'm, I'm guessing I know the answer, but have you done any kind of cold acquisition for your agency? I have not actually. We have not run one single ad. Yeah. Uh, not even retargeting, which we should set up retargeting. Honestly, that's just like laziness on our part. Um, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but I'll, I'll give you a good tip actually. So I wouldn't, if, if it were me and I had just started a, a newbie agency, as you called it, um, I wouldn't actually really run ads except for retargeting. But what I would do is I would be very, very active in all the good Facebook groups like mine and Depeche's. Um, and, uh, and I would, I would help a lot of people. And then what I found is, uh, companies, uh, will reach out to you uh, and ask you, Hey, can you run my campaigns for me? I see you know your stuff, right? Like I trust you. I can see you really know what you're talking about. Um, so that's how you can get a lot of business for for free uh, and help people at the same time. Um, so that's like a nice win-win. Um, that's how. That's literally how I get uh, you know my I get clients myself. Uh, Chris Colbert, uh, you know one of the awesome moderators in in my group. He has a whole uh, agency built on just literally people hitting him up. Um, inbound leads. Um, inbound leads are are much stronger. Um, uh, you know, much higher close rate, much usually less of a hassle. Um, so, so that's personally where I would focus my efforts if I were you. Absolutely, and, and you know, one thing I will touch on is um, I think so. There's there's one guy, for example, I know he's doing the rounds on my group, on Tim's group. I won't call him out, um, but all he's doing is just posting updates, just like this is my way of doing this, this is my way, and they're literally just post updates, and he's not engaging, he's not feeding back, he's not answering questions of other people, and he's not getting engagement. He may be a super, super top Facebook ads guy, but it comes from engagement. And it's actually when you're um, hidden in the comments, but you're actually interacting with people, that's mm -hmm. where people really get the most value from you. And that's where people will reach out for more information. So it's, yes, absolutely post up your screenshots, your case studies, all that kind of stuff, but get in the comments. That's where the value is as well. Yeah, I don't. I, I find that uh, I don't even post that much in my groups, like actual the first post but I respond to a lot of comments and I respond to a lot of posts. And just like you said, that's where a lot of the value is, honestly. There's a lot of hidden gems a lot of times in these comments that people just don't ever see. Because there's like whole like whole conversations that go on, like in like little threaded conversations that'll be like 20 or 30 replies in there and people just don't see it, which is you know unfortunate. But if yeah. you're super active in these, you find it and people will, will see it, you know? Absolutely. Um, question from Chris, what is the cost of the LA event and what is the date? Um, also, do you have a registration page? Uh, so uh, the cost for uh, for all my events is uh, six thousand uh, dollars US, uh, and uh, uh, and the register and the dates uh, I believe it's November. It's the first week in no 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 sorry that one is uh, the newbie one is like the fourth and the fifth I think, and then the the advanced one is uh, the fourteenth and fifteenth or fifteenth and sixteenth somewhere around there. Um, but if you go on a uh, timbird .com, um, that's where I have all my events: the retreats, the masterminds, uh, uh, the replays. Uh, you can find, I, I put it together, um, it's on a Shopify store, it looks really good. Um, you can find everything all in one place. Um, and there's a link also to, for anybody you guys watching, there's a link also to the London one with Depeche, uh, which I highly recommend you guys go to. It's especially the last one in Europe and it's gonna be fucking epic. I'm really excited for that. Awesome, um, so it's timbird.com, right? I'm just gonna add it into the comments. Correct, yeah. Um, and you've had actually recently had it redesigned as well. Um, so guys, go and check it out. Um, I used to use ClickFunnels uh, and uh, it was just, it's just a, such a hassle though. It like loaded slow and there's like not much, you know, you can customize that really that well. Um, so with Shopify now, I have like Messenger integrated and it looks way better and you know, the yeah. discounts are easier like for coupon codes and whatever you want. Like it's just so much better, honestly. So for, for, for my needs, it was, I think it looked way better too. Absolutely. Um, qu question from Trevor. I had an ad set doing pretty good on auto 
uh, getting conversions, thirty to forty dollars CPP. Duplicated it to a new campaign to try a manual bid, but CPP has shot up to hundred, uh, hundred plus. I have the max bid set to about one seventy. Not sure what to do next. Uh, that is fairly high. Um, I'm guessing that uh, uh, maybe it's only been a day or two, or or possibly you, you just ads got like a bad a bad start. If your ads just like you start at a bad time of day, or maybe on a day when uh, you know Trump does something stupid and it's like all over the news and people aren't really as concerned about you know stuff going on in their feed per se, um, then if you start off with a bad CTR, then your costs just shoot up like that. So um, if it ha has been more than a day or two, um, then I would kill that. Uh, and revisit your creatives uh, and possibly just dupe the campaign and start it again. And one, one thing I'd um, maybe ask you, Tim, so he said he's actually duplicated the ad set into a new campaign. Would you do that or keep it in the same campaign? Uh, if it has bad history like that, a lot of that is stored on the can like within the campaign level. Um, so then if, if it's bad, then I put it in a new campaign. But if stuff's going good and I just want to like dupe the ad set or try some new targeting, but everything's going good, then I'll just keep it in the same campaign. Exactly. So I, I think that that would have been my point. So if you had the ad set doing really well, you've hit 30, 40 on auto, and you want to go into manual, keep it in the same campaign. Oh. Um, and then obviously, if it goes bad, then move it into a separate campaign. Yes and no, though, because if it's in there, then you're going to be competing kind of with your own ad set. Um, but you can, you can um, with the manual bid and versus also, what I found is when you go into auto, it starts to take its own kind of life and stuff. And then I just end up pausing the original so then start testing in auto but yeah that's absolutely true you will get overlap and especially if your budgets are high so if you're doing low budget um ad sets the the overlap is going to be minimal um but yeah that's definitely something to keep an eye on as well yeah i try to separate my campaigns uh like if i do any auto bid usually it's in the beginning of a, a, a ad account and i'll keep that usually in its own campaign and then i usually do manual bid in its own campaign cool um tim if you had a five to ten dollar a day budget ad set, which I don't think you'd ever have, um, you three or six X your ROAS, would you scale it aggressively with manual bid? Honestly, uh, so rule number one, if it's working great, don't touch it. <laughs> um, uh, if, if you raise that budget, you're probably not going to do a very good ROAS. And I don't know what, like, like if it were me, I would scale it because I, I don't really care. Like if, I, if I'm not making that $50 a day from that, that doesn't bother me. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know your your financial situation. But if 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 you have that and a bunch of other ad sets at small volume making you good money, then just leave it alone. You know. Um, but if you don't care about that and you rather risk it, uh, then absolutely I would scale that up. Um, but you do keep in mind there is going to be some optimization time, and you probably will lower that ROAS most likely. Absolutely. Um, Oliver Kenyon's giving you the eyes. I thought I'd just um, bring that up for you, Tim. <laughs> uh, what's up, Oliver? Um, Question from Danny. How often do you optimize for front end events? So landing page views, add to carts, higher up the funnels. Do you have do you find having a blend of optimization events and therefore signals helps with overall performance? Uh, I try to never optimize for those, um, except for in certain cases where like like my mastermind events, for example, I can't optimize for conversions because there's only like 20 seats in each mastermind. So I can't get 10 conversions or 20 conversions a day. There's just not physically like enough room. Um, so for those, uh, I'll usually um, uh, optimize for uh, landing page views, uh, just because then I can get enough data for the app, for the algorithm. Um, so yeah. depending on the situation, but if you're doing something where there is not like a limit, then I try to always optimize for what I want, which would be like purchases or leads or whatever you're doing. Um, I find that like most of the time does better. Absolutely. Um, how many? How much time do you have left? I know it's in, on hit the hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's keep going, bro. Cool, we've got lots of questions here. Um, so question from Saeed, if, apart from Facebook ads, what other channel would you recommend learn, uh, learning? It's a good question. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in YouTube right now. Um, and they just came out uh, fairly recently uh, with uh, their TrueView uh, uh, conversion stuff. Um, so it actually now has like better call to action buttons and stuff in YouTube videos, which is really nice. Uh, and, uh, and I also think that Google Ads is really nice, uh, like, uh, like AdWords. Um, and I think it's uh, underutilized. Uh, uh, for a lot of stuff, uh, and then uh, uh, Pinterest, people don't really talk about. Um, but that's good for like fashion and you know cooking stuff and uh, fitness. Like it's kind of like Instagram too. It's similar kind of uh, demographics. I feel like uh, ish uh, as far as uh, like what works well at least. Not maybe the demographics, but uh, but yeah. I mean, I think there's uh, 
I'd say YouTube would probably be the, the the next one I would mess with, and it's it's a lot easier. You really just are choosing like basically like like categories, uh, and you just throw your video. I mean, it's it's it's, it's way easier than Facebook. True. Um, question from Jerry: Following the bully method for two days, still not profitable. Shall I keep or kill it? One uh, k budget per day, sixty dollar bid, blowing up budgets in twelve hours um, and losing money. Uh, it depends how much you're losing. Uh, like. Like let's say you're so I'm guessing if your bid is sixty that you're caught your your target's like twenty maybe like your actual target if I'm guessing um, so if you're if it's like still above forty uh, dollar CPA then I would kill it but like if you're like at thirty and like not too far off kind of thing then I would keep it um, uh, but it, uh, generally if if the bully method is not working after a few days uh, generally it's because uh, something else is off like your campaign structure or maybe the the ad itself, the ad copy, or it could be even that you have like negative comments in the ad uh, that you didn't hide or respond to or something. So people are seeing that and it's killing your conversion rate. That's so important uh, as well, yeah. So it kind of depends, but yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I think I answered it. So, so maybe related to that, how do you find your bid level, Tim? So there's different methods. There's duplicating into many ad sets. There's using one and then starting high reducing or starting low increasing. What's your preference? Uh, mine is is like I like to bully and just do three to five x uh, and then don't touch it. Um, okay. I literally just like won't touch it. And basically, if it doesn't work, if it's too high, I, I I revisit my creative and my landing page and stuff like that because I know if that I, that I, I know I can scale the shit out of it if I can get it to work with bully because mm -hmm. bully is it's a little more complicated for sure. Uh, but if I can get it to work with bully, I can scale that I can scale that to the moon, right? In crypto terms. Um, so uh, so then I revisit other things if if it's not working. Absolutely. So um, interesting comment from um, Stephen. So like one of the things about the bully method is you need to have a good ad set and a good group of ads. And so recently you talked about um, the 388 method of actually firing up um, the, the kind of foundations. And I use something called the graduation framework, um, which is all about finding the best ad sets and creatives as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible, and then moving them into your website conversion. Because then if you've done all the, all the groundwork and you know you've got good ad set and a good group of ads, then, then bullying works because you, you've already pre-tested. Um, yep. is, is that kind of what you'd recommend of like layering the 388 and then building up to shotgun stuff? Yeah, yeah. So 388 is more of a, and for those of you guys in the ad leaks group, uh, I'm posting that video next, uh, next Wednesday, so in like six days from now. So I hired a few, uh, a few of my buddies, uh, and we each are going to be dropping a knowledge bomb every single day. So my day is Wednesdays, so my bombs will always be on Wednesdays in there. Um, but uh, so three at eight, though, is more of like a, like a, like a testing. Like that's how I set up the campaigns to start, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then I'm killing bad ad sets, keeping good ones, you know, making new ads, killing bad ads, that kind of thing. Uh, and then when every, when I see I have some winning ad sets, I have some winning ads, then boom, then it's the shotgun and surf for scaling. Those are. Those are like straight, just like scaling tactics. You don't really want to like uh, test with that. You'll lose a lot of money. Um, and let's see, let's see. I'm looking at Steven's comment here. I have a huge collection of safe posts from the various groups. Graduation framework for surfing for converters. Oh, big win. So I don't know anything about the graduation framework. So uh, I'm assuming I'm going to learn about that in London. You're going to learn so about it in uh, London. And um, I think it's going to be quite cool to see some of our strategies and stuff merge together and see what other people can come up with. I think that's going to be really awesome to see. Oh, well. absolutely. I, I actually learn a lot from the masterminds. Like uh, uh, there'll be people like throwing in random uh, comments about what's working for them. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I didn't even think about that. Exactly. You know, exactly. yeah, That's really cool. Completely agree. Um, interesting question from Tim. So um, small audience issues. Let's say you're uh, an Aussie or a Kiwi, small population. So like a 1% lookalike is tiny. Um, what do you see as the most effective way to maintain scale for lead gen offers to audiences less than one mil? Uh, well, Tim Clark, you're my favorite Australian, by the way. Uh, uh, what is, what, you, you've asked me this question before, and uh, I, I probably give you a different answer every time because there's like so many different ways to handle this, honestly. Uh, uh, carpet bomb is a good way to go. Um, uh, we're just basically hitting like everybody and then uh, retargeting video views. Uh, it's kind of like the simple way to explain that. Uh, and uh, uh, but what I would do now for uh, any uh, small audience is if you're forced to be in that small audience uh, is uh, run all the different objectives. So I'd be running like reach, uh, traffic, uh, conversions on landing page views, conversions on view content, conversions on leads, uh, video views, uh, engagement. Basically, you're going to hit like different pockets of people with each one. Um, and then you're just going to have to like refresh your creatives a lot. Uh, and, uh, and then I would multivariate test my landing pages and rotate them. 
um, to get like squeeze like every bit of longevity out of those that you can. Absolutely. So interesting thing, someone shared a document in my group, which was talking about how Facebook now recommend running multiple objectives to get together. So if you spoke to a rep, let's say now they do. Ago, yeah. a year ago, you know, they're like, <laughs> don't merge them, all that kind of stuff. And I just think it's so interesting that people like us have been doing this for years and Facebook reps are saying like, you know, that's not the way to do it. Now they're saying this is best practice. And actually they're talking about don't create a funnel where you have video views, then you have um, conversion, then et cetera, et cetera, but actually merging them together. And I honestly wonder if they actually watch people like you what you're doing and actually feed that back into their program. Oh, yeah. They absolutely like, do, actually. Uh, at Traffic and Conversion Summit last year, um, I went and I met a guy that worked for Facebook. Um, and uh, and he's like, hey, I'm in your ad buyer group, Rick. I really love it. I'm like, oh, like, how do you hear about it? You know? uh, and, uh, and he's like, oh, I went through this training class uh, when I joined Facebook, and they recommended that all of us join the group. Awesome. Awesome. You know? So there's, there's like a good two, 300 people from Facebook in my group. Uh, a lot of them do it for their side jobs, you know, their side gigs or whatever. They like want to learn how to run traffic too. But uh, I guess like a lot of people, they actually like that's how they get support. Because if you think about it, like these reps, like where do they learn Facebook? Ads, so true. You know? so true. Like blue blueprint, you know, blueprint's good to like learn, but like for hands on, you can only really learn from hands on experience or from other people with hands on experience. Exactly. So they have to be in these groups, like you know, looking at like best practices, and if they see that like. This guy continually, like all these people, it's working for them, and they're going to start recommending it to their clients. You know, I, I can't wait to see Shotgun and um, Surf in Blueprint. That'll be so <laughs> right. <laughs> oh man, they better not put that in Blueprint. But the thing is, I had actually I had a chat with a, a rep today, and um, he shared something in a private group. I said, "Can you share it in my group, etc." Um, and it, he actually, so one of the um, questions in my group is how much you're spending a day, and he actually spent put his number in. I was like, "Are you running ads as well?" He said, yeah, you know, that's the only way to learn. And, you know, I think other reps should be doing it. You totally. know, this guy is completely on it. If you speak to other reps, they're like, you know, you know, we don't really get time to spend money on ads. Honestly, I don't think, you know, this is like going, for example, to uh, a BMW dealership and the guy's driving a Mercedes. Like, if you're, not, if you're not living it, then you can't sell it. And I think that's, that's such a big problem within Facebook. And, and that's where a lot, a lot of the reps get bad rep, reputation. Because yeah. they're recommending stuff, which is um, literally just written on a piece of paper. They haven't got a clue whether it works or not. They've just been told by their boss, this is how you do it. And I think that's such a shame as well. No, I know. I wish I wish more of them, even even for just like a week, if they just ran ads for like a week, they'd have like such a better idea of what they're talking about. Absolutely. Um, and actually, th that's a big risk for Facebook as well, because if these reps realize that they can make money out of Facebook, they're going to leave, and that happens, right? There's so many people yeah. that have left Facebook well, they have, as well. Yeah, they, so. have really, they have really high turnover. Exactly, exactly. Um, question from George. So what's your view on ad copy versus targeting? Do you think if your targeting is spot on, the ad copy is less relevant, or would you say it's worth investing in top quality ad copy over testing and more targeting? Uh, I think that the creative matters way more than the targeting, uh, like, like infinitely more. Um, the targeting matters, but but not really. Like, if you have a good creative, you can go super broad, uh, yeah. and uh, and and you're good to go. Um, so I would invest a lot more time and effort into the ad copy than I would the targeting. Basically, the targeting, what I do is I just like throw shit at throw shit at the wall. I'll try like a bunch of random interests. I try some some very broad ad sets, some lookalikes, three percent, five, eight, ten, like engagers, like just kind of like literally like throw a bunch of shit at the wall, and then you just see what works. But I find that the creative really does matter the most. So I'd put a lot of effort into that. How are you? Absolutely. Um, question from Sam. How often does the bully method outperform the other bid levels on manual bid? I found on my 1K day e-com ad sets that bidding a bit more than the product cost works best, especially with Q4 coming up. What do you think is going to be the best way to drive CPA, CPA down? So uh, Companion Labs is a pretty cool tool, and uh, I do find that works pretty well. Um, but I use that like in conjunction with my bully method when I have a winning ad set. So I'll like uh, like put like a... Uh, bid test and then in brackets you can put like uh, 200% and then it like bids like within the suggested range 200% higher um, or 300% higher. Um, so it's like a bully bid test basically. Uh, and uh, and I find that that works really well. Um, uh, but if, if, so right now if bidding just more than the product cost is working well for you, then uh, you're in, you know, come kind of deeper into Q4, um, you're going to probably find that you need to bid more. Um, uh, and, uh, and you'll probably get similar to results that you're getting right now. Right, Absolutely. Um, 
more of a statement than a question, but Mike says Pinterest ads is total balls. <laughs> like in a good way? I think that's a bad way because uh, I, <laughs> I, know, I know Mike and I know his, um, his sense of humor as well. So um, I've done Pinterest ads. I was actually on one of the early betas in 2015. And what I found is, is which is still true, is Pinterest is not going to be your direct response channel. It's, it's just a channel that sits right at the top. Um, but the good thing is when you run ads, those like if you look at Facebook, the ad runs, it goes in the newsfeed and disappears. With Pinterest, they end up living on. And actually, the ad has massive organic reach post serving as well. But actually, it's a big awareness piece. Um, there's probably people that are good doing well with direct response. But I would use Pinterest as part of the marketing mix. So you're not going to get any kind of scale similar to Facebook ads. But if you're running Facebook, Google, YouTube, all that kind of stuff, then Pinterest can be a good contributor to that as well. So I wouldn't necessarily agree that Pinterest is really like not worth doing. Same with Snapchat. Like honestly, I'm not a Snapchat user. Right? That missed me a couple of generations ago. Um, but I know people are killing it there, and it's about finding the right use for it, finding the right customer, um, and the right kind of marketing yes. for it as well. Same thing with Pinterest. I know people are crushing it on Pinterest, but it's so that there's like a 30 to 60 day like. Uh, lifespan of your ads basically whether you know like on facebook like you just said it's like a day or whatever right yeah. um uh, so on pinterest you just get way longer so um I, but it depends what you're running you know i haven't really run much on pinterest in a long time so i don't know that, that's your next uh, facebook ads group pinterest users <laughs> um, I, don't have a, I don't have a pinterest ads group yeah that's true a question from jordan um top three principles that people should follow when approaching facebook ads hmm uh, spend a lot of time on your creative. Uh, make sure you have the proper campaign structure, because without that, then you're just going to be setting up for failure. Uh, and feed the algorithm plenty of data. Uh, if you do that, you'll have much better luck. Cool. Um, question from John. Uh, testing landers on Facebook, what's your process, and what recommended tools do you use to test landers? What do you do, Depeche? Um, so I prefer to use um, either Google um, Website Optimizer or BWO, Visual Website Optimizer. The Google one's free, and actually it's, it's underrated. Honestly, it's a really good tool. It's limited. You can't run a whole mass of tests um, if you want to do a bit more than BWO. Um, but yeah, apart from that, if you're using ClickFunnels, it's got built-in split tests. You can do an A-B test. That's as best as you can get. Um, the way I approach landing page testing is Test different pages, very different pages and layouts and stuff. Find your winner and then do multivariate testing within that. So different buttons, different images, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of my approach to that. Uh, I like doing something similar where I like testing like two or three like super different landers. Um, but then I like multivariate testing them also. Uh, cool. And then because you might find that like one of them, you know, your control was just crap. Uh, yeah. And that with a different image, different headline, it like beats all the other landers. Um, so I kind of like doing, I mean, you just need like a boatload of traffic for it though, which sucks. Yeah, I mean, like, you lose more money up front, but, um, but I find that on the back end, you make more money. And I actually saw a video um, today that Mo posted of his little mini interview at Affiliate World Conference in Barcelona. And he said that conversion rate optimization is free cash. And it is so true. Like mm -hmm. you could be, you could maintain your spend on Facebook ads and your performance and spend a ton of time optimizing every part of your journey. Like when, when I speak to people about conversion rate optimization, I've spent a lot of time in this field, they're looking at click to purchase, but you need to look at all the micro points between that. So um, from clicking into your lander, into your product page, from product page into cart, cart, et cetera, and actually squeeze it all the way through. And that's where you get the best value from as well. Yeah, if you can, people don't, they, they spend so much effort trying to like optimize their Facebook costs down. Uh, when you can like literally spend like 20 minutes setting up a multivariate test, and then yeah. after like a week or two, you've like doubled your conversion rate on your landing page, which is the exact same thing as cutting your sale costs, like cost per purchase in half. Um, exactly. It's free money. <laughs> it's crazy Absolutely. people don't do it. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Um, question from Oleg. Does deleting negative comments hurt your ad performance, or is it better to hide them? Uh, you'll find like varying answers to this. My personal um, uh, thing is uh, that uh, you should you should hide them and not delete them. Yeah, I agree. I agree because if you also if you do delete them, the user's notified and that will probably piss them off. So if you hide them, the user can still see them, but the other people um, who are not friends of the person that posted can't see them as well. So it's it's just a safer way of doing it. Um, question from Naveen. So who's the best person to learn? from for YouTube advertising? Anyone uh, either in, in your circles? 
Honestly, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of great people. I just don't. I just don't know them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't so, know uh, if I know them. I, I think what I do, um, which I'd probably recommend, is when you're on YouTube or spend time on YouTube and have a look at the people that are actually doing really well. So, for example, I like Billy Jean's um, ads on YouTube. I think he crushes it when it comes to merging Facebook and Google. Uh, sorry, AdWords in particular. Uh, sorry, YouTube in particular. He uses YouTube a lot more for retargeting um, and uses Facebook and other channels for cold traffic. Um, I think he does do a lot of cold uh, now on YouTube as well. Um, but have a look at other people and what they're doing and learn from their approaches. So, for example, uh, one of the things is if the if the video that's being um, you're, you're looking at is related to the ad that you're seeing, then it's most likely cold. If it has no relation, it's probably a retargeting ad. So you can start to make some sense out of what people are doing. Um, but I try and follow people that are doing really well on YouTube. I don't know if there are any big names. Honestly, I don't um, within um, YouTube advertising. There's some guys that are really good at it, and my Google is called Google Ad Buyers. Um, so if you join my Google Ad Buyers group, there are some guys that are really good at it in there. But there, cool. but I don't think the I don't know anybody that's like a like a Google Ad Guru. You know, I don't know. Absolutely. Well, there's a there's a position if anyone wants to apply. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> question from Steven. So. This is quite interesting. Have you actually tested the bully method on any other ad platform like AdWords? Absolutely. Actually, on AdWords, it crushes, and that's where I originally kind of uh, 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 that's not sorry, not originally, um, but that's uh, that's one place I have tested it, uh, and uh, and it's the same kind of concept though, uh, where uh, you know you're bidding higher, which gives you a higher placement on the search uh, the the SERP page, uh, and then you get a higher, and then because of that, you have a higher CTR. Uh, so then they kind of like artificially think you have a higher quality, which then lowers your price. So it's kind of like a very similar concept to how it works on Facebook. Uh, and you're bidding people out, right? Like if someone else for that keyword is, is they're unprofitable, they're going to be like, okay, pause, or they're going to lower their bid, you know, whatever, right? So either way, you're still bullying people out. And especially with keywords that don't have like huge volume, you can easily bully people out of those because there's just so little, you know, for a small amount of money because there's just not a lot of volume. So. Absolutely. Um, question from uh, Renee: Can we get links to your groups? Are they on Timbird.com? They, they are be. not on Timbird.com. I know they're on AdLeaks.com though. If you go to AdLeaks.com cool. and click uh, Groups in the top nav, there's links. There's links to all of them. Awesome. Um, question from Sean: Tim, for your surfing method, do you run that OK brand new campaigns? Probably on brand new campaigns. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, or, or proven campaigns. So, okay, so since I like to do higher budgets to start even on testing, just with maybe fewer ad sets, um, I, I'll surf. Basically, you just surfing is just like cranking the budget pretty much when it's doing good, right? It's like we can boil it down to. Uh, so uh, it doesn't have to be like a proven campaign since it's like a, one, a day by day. If you have a few ad sets that are like rocking and rolling today, then you just crank those budgets and make that money. And then you just kind of reset them back to what they were. And then you do it again tomorrow. So you could even surf like day one or day two, you know, like on a brand new campaign. It doesn't have to be proven. Cool. Um, we'll take a few more questions. So, Anton, in terms of testing, which method do you think is better, traffic or straight to conversion for purchasing? I think straight to conversions, personally. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I don't know if you agree with Tim, but do not use traffic campaigns on cold. Like, it's a complete waste of money. Um, yeah, the, the only thing I use those on is like articles on ad leaks because the the goal for those is just traffic. So well, that's it. Yeah, I mean, if you're yeah. looking to get sales and stuff, because basically it will just open up to anyone that's likely to uh, click into your site. So even then, um, I'd probably consider page post engagement, maybe um, even website conversion with landing page view. It's still kind of just it depends kind of what you want to get, but especially if you're testing something that's got purchase involved, then you know website conversion. Um, has to be the way to go. Absolutely. Uh, cool. So who's going to get the final question? Let's see. So Mike, here we go. So do you recommend using the same post ID across different cold audience campaigns, targeting different audiences? If not, when would you recommend using the same post ID across different campaigns? Uh, I absolutely recommend using it across every audience, across every campaign, um, unless, OK, there is a big but here. Uh, if you have like bad feedback or like uh, people don't really love your product and you have a lot of haters in the comments, like a lot, uh, well, one, fix the reason they're not liking it, like better customer service, better product, whatever, right? Uh, but uh, but in the meantime, 
then you, that's probably a one the, the one situation where you don't want to share social proof because then it's going to hurt you uh, across all of your campaigns and stuff, right? Uh, so, uh, but other than that, uh, yes, I would recommend sharing it across everything. Cool. Um, so that's about forty-five minute, uh, sorry, hour and forty-five of pure class and value from Tim Bird. So thanks, Tim, for joining us today. Um, his website link is links below, timbird.com for the masterminds, events, um, adleaks.com as well for um, the group and also links to the other groups that Tim runs. And I didn't realize there were so many as well. Um, but yeah, leave your appreciation for Tim in the comments and with your love hearts and your likes as well. Anything, Tim, to say before we sign off? Oh, well, I want to say thank you to Pesh for having me, and uh, I'm glad uh, we got to sync up in Barcelona there because now we get to work, do some work together. And uh, I'm really looking forward to London. I think uh, I have a lot that uh, I can learn from you as well, so I'm excited. Me too. Thanks, Tim. Um, cheers, guys. We shall see you online soon. Thank you.